So this is chapter 10, the goodness of God. When I think of the goodness of God, I am so incredibly glad for that. Uh, I spend an unfortunate part of my life dealing with people that are involved on the dark side, some involved in direct demonic kinds of things, other people involved in just the worldly stuff. And when I see the darkness that's there and the different character of, of the demonic realm from Yahweh, the God of all goodness, I'm so, so, so delighted that God is good, that God is compassionate and gracious and good. And we want to unpack the goodness of God here in this session. Uh, it's, gosh, it's good. So uh, Dr. Erickson breaks it down in three kind of categories, and it's somewhat artificial, but you've got to do something, kind of get a piece on things, between moral purity, uh, integrity, and, uh, and love. So let's unpack them a little bit. He begins with moral purity, and boy, that's, a, that's so important. And he begins with holiness, which is, gosh, what a great place to begin. And when you think of God as holy, uh, well, let's look at it. Uh, take a look at Isaiah chapter 6. Okay, Isaiah chapter 6. Yeah, turn there. Because I want to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of booger on actually looking at the Bible and hearing what God says. Isaiah chapter 6, astonishing stuff, absolutely astonishing stuff. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of Terob filled the temple. And there were seraphim, these burning ones, these angelic characters around him. And they've got wings and they're doing all this stuff. And they're crying out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. I mean, ringing affirmation of the holiness of God from these powerful angels. Sound of the voice of the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple filled with smoke. Now, so here's the thrice holy God, and here's Isaiah. <laughs> What's his response when he sees the thrice holy God here in verse 5? Well, woe is me, he says. I can just imagine. Ay, 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 ay. Think for a minute. It doesn't say in the text, but what do you think Isaiah's posture is when he sees the awesome, thrice holy God? Uh, I don't know about you, but my picture is he's on his face in the dirt, digging in, trying to get away from this God because he's a dead man. I mean, it says as much. I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm living among people of unclean lips, and I am ruined. Whee! What does God do? One of the seraphim, one of the burning ones, flew to me with a live coal that he'd picked off the altar. So here's a burning angel with a burning coal from the thrice holy God to the sinful Isaiah, and here comes this guy, angel toward him. And I'm sure he's expecting to be turned into a puff of smoke. But that's not what happens. He touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, he says. Your sin atoned for. This is the holy God to a sinful being, Isaiah. And the holy God? I mean, the question that I always hear and think about, can the holy God, can the thrice holy God have sin in his presence? And many people just automatically say, no, no, he can't. But what happens here? Isaiah is a sinner, and not only is he in the presence of the thrice holy God, it's actually the thrice holy God who comes to him. And when Isaiah sees the holiness of God, what he does is he confesses his sin to God. I mean, I have unclean lips. And what God's response is, is to take this burning coal and cleanse him. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. 
And then it keeps on going. Verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send who will go for us? What's God looking for? He's looking for a covenant partner to get a job done. And Isaiah said in the verse 8, Here am I, send me. Now again, thought. What's Isaiah's posture when he volunteers for this job? Here am I, send me. What's his posture? What was it in verse 5? On his face. Ah! What is it in verse 8? Well, my picture is, let me do it, let me do it. He's pretty excited, wants to do it. And the question I ask myself is, what is the proper posture of a human in the presence of the thrice holy God? And the answer is, walking together in covenant partnership. Now, why is he on his face in verse 5? Because that's the sinner. The position of a sinner before God is in reverent worship, begging the mercy of God, confessing his sin. God's response is to cleanse and restore. Then he can be up and we can work together. The proper posture of humans is to be working in covenant partnership with God, walking side by side. He's God, we're not, to be sure. But our presence before God is image bearers walking as Adam walked with God in the garden, seems to me. But what's holiness? I, I think holiness we see here as purity, because when, Isaiah, when the holy God comes, he makes Isaiah pure. But there's more than that, too. A picture of holiness means dedicated to. Uh, for example, I have a cup here. Uh, my wife got it. She didn't particularly like it, so I did. And it's got some stuff in it. Helpful to have a little liquid when I'm teaching. This cup is holy. <laughs> it's not pure, I promise you. Oh my gosh. But what is it? It's dedicated to my use. And I think that's the first meaning of holiness is dedicated to. And because it's dedicated to, it's separated from. So Bethany is not going to use my cup. I'm confident because uh, it, it's separated from her or she's separated from it probably because the cup is not pure. But it's dedicated to is the first thing. And God is dedicated to himself, Trinity. So he's always been holy. Before creation, before he was separated from anything, he is dedicated to himself in the tripersonal relationship of the Trinity. And he is morally pure. He is good and right in every way. And I think what happens, God holiness is what actually brings him to the place of sin. Genesis chapter 3 after the fall or Isaiah chapter 6 in the presence of Isaiah the sinful man to bring cleansing and holiness. Jesus comes to lepers and touches them and cleanses them because he is holy. At the end of the day, there will be no sin in God's presence to be sure. But at this point, God's holiness is what brings him to the place of sin to bring cleansing and healing. So holiness is dedicated to and morally pure. Uh, and I think those are good definitions of holiness. Uh, God is also righteous. Uh, he is just, two huge terms. Uh, righteousness uh, is looking for a community. It's a communal relationship where all relationships, God, others, self, rest of creation, are well-ordered to God designed to be. When God is righteous, it means that he's that kind of person in his community, the Trinity. They're other-centered. The relationship as it should be. Uh, justice means that he does things with a, a fair standard, a true standard of good and right. Uh, we could unpack those at great length, and you can read about that a bit. It's just, but his moral purity is there. His integrity. Uh, God is genuine. The way he reveals himself is who he really is. That's not always true for humans. We know scam artists that all the time come and pretend to be something they're not. I just got an email from a friend of mine, and it said, I need your help. I'm stranded in a foreign country. They've stolen my passport and my wallet. Could you send me money? Well, you know what? 
I don't think that was integrity. Uh, and we get that kind of stuff happening all the time. God never comes as a scammer. He always comes with integrity, and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, he's, uh, what he says is true. Uh, he is known for his faithfulness. He keeps his promises, so we saw in Malachi 6. Uh, let's follow a little journey. Go back to Genesis chapter 2, Genesis 12. Go to Genesis 12. Are you there? Genesis 12. Go from your country, your people, your father's household. I'll make you a great nation. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. All their people's earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham took off and did that. When they get in verse 7, it says here, The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Okay. Now, what's the problem? No kids. So what's God saying here? I will give you offspring. Okay. So he's, how old is he here? How old is he here? He's 75, says so here, verse 4. Let's go 15 years later, chapter 15. Uh, God says, I will be your great, very great reward. What does Abram say? Sovereign Lord, what can you give me? I am childless. So he got a promise 15 years ago he's going to have his kid, no kid. The guy here at my estate is this guy from Damascus. You've given him no children. So God says, this man will not be your heir, but a son of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Now, he is 90 years old. His wife is 80 years old. How many 80-year-old women have babies? <laughs> the answer is, mm -mm. she's old. But God says, I'll take care of the details. And Abram says, it says, Abram believed God. And literally the word there is amen God. Abram amen God. And God counted that as righteousness. God said that kind of trust, even when it makes no sense, is righteousness. Okay? Now, follow the story. Chapter 18. This is now ten more years. Lord appeared to Abraham, Abraham saw him. It's a great story, I'd love to go through that. Uh, and he picks us some lunch, or actually has Sarah fix some lunch. And they get some good stuff. God says in verse 9, where's Sarah? And, oh, she's in the tent. One of them said, I will surely return about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. She's 89 years old now. Sarah is listening. Abraham and Sarah are already very old, and Sarah passed the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed. Yeah, I used to believe that. After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, how will I have this pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And say, well, will you have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard? Hard, literally too wonderful for God. That's that unlimited power. Is anything too wonderful for God? I return to the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. This is a promise that was made a long time ago. Sarah was afraid she lied. I didn't laugh. This is where you see the character of God. What's the tone of God's voice when he says, Yes, you did laugh? What's the tone of his voice? says a lot about your picture of God. Some people, God is angry. You did laugh. Now come on, confess. Other people is just, yeah, of course you laughed. You rolled eyes syndrome. I think what God does is say, of course you laughed. But I get it. Nonetheless, there's a, boy, there's a baby coming. And you know what happened in chapter 19? A little... Laughter, Isaac is our, the Hebrew word. It just means laughter. Laughter shows up. Amazing. 90 years old and she has a baby. The world will laugh with me. It's amazing. God's faithful to his promise. And then we get this really strange story in chapter 22 where God says, take laughter 
sacrifice him. Slaughter him, slice him up, burn him. And God tells Abraham to do the unthinkable. So he heads off to do it. And in verse 5, he says to the men, we will worship and then we will come back to you. What's God told him to do? Slaughter him, slice him up, burn him. And he calls that worship? That's what you do to Moloch. That's not what you do to Yahweh. But he goes ahead and depending on God's faithfulness, they get to the mountain and he lays out his son, binds him up and is ready to slaughter him. The angel Lord stops him and says, don't lay a hand on the boy. And there's the ram in the thicket. God provides. There's a fascinating development here. Back in verse 8, Abram says to Isaac, God will provide, future tense. And God did provide the ram, verse 13. But look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. Abram called that place, the Lord will provide. So Jehovah Jireh in older terms, Yahweh Jireh. Past, present, or future. It's future. But the ram's already been provided. Isaac isn't slaughtered. And it, to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So this day, well, that would be Moses, some 500 years later, writing this book. To this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So it's a picture looking forward to Messiah, Isaac, representing Isaiah, and this mountain, Moriah, is Temple Mount, Mount Zion, or Mount Calvary. On this mountain, the sacrifice will be made. Isaac relates to Jesus, I think, and Abraham relates to the Father to give us a picture of what it was like for the Father to sacrifice his son at this point. The faithfulness of God is that he will provide what we need, ultimately the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In this picture, this prophetic picture, we see later on, on this same mountain, the father is going to sacrifice his son, and they're both going to be in absolute agony, absolute agony through the sacrifice. Just think what it would be like for a loving, compassionate God to father to sacrifice his son. I've got two sons. There's no way I can do that. No way. Mm -mm. Can't happen. But Yahweh did it. Father did it. Son course, agony, because you go through being sacrificed. The father and the son partnered together, both agonizing to provide the substitutionary sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of the father and the son pictured here. And we see the faithfulness of God and that Abraham can rely, yes, there will be a son, and then when he's asked to sacrifice the son, can still rely on the faithfulness of God. How can you work this out? How can you work this out? What I do is take the word of God and I say, okay, this is true. I do not get this, but I'll try to live my life in light of it. That's what it means to believe that God is faithful. There are a lot of attributes here we could unpack. But one of the questions is how does God's love and justice relate to each other? If God is really loving, why would he slaughter sinners? And if God is really loving, he gives his best to people. If God is really just, he cannot not punish sin. How do those relate to each other? Well, of course, the mix of those two, love and justice, come together at the cross, where we see this ultimate act of his love, where he, the father, agonizingly slaughters his son, who is fully willing to be sacrificed and participates so that his justice can be satisfied and he can give us the freedom that his love desires. Now, how those two relate, love and justice, ultimately we can't really understand. But the place of the revelation we see that is in Jesus Christ, particularly in his crucifixion. 
So I think when we understand the character of God, the best place to look is really in the revelation of Jesus Christ in the incredible, incredible work that happens in the death, resurrection, and exaltation of Jesus. Much to ponder, beginning thoughts. I hope they're helpful. Thank you.